the stars are a compass to follow for safety. A clock that calls the beginnings of night. A calendar that marks a time for change. The night sky has forever guided our place on Earth. A source of meaning, perspective and light. Now in 2040, 9 billion people are living on our tiny blue dot. 31 million on our sunburned island. So how is our water, our food, our fuels? Do they work for us or do we work for them? As our traffic quietly drives itself, are we universally sustained so we have more time? Time to stare at the stars. What's up in the 2040 sky? What systems, networks and technologies are keeping Australia safe? Tracking our growth, checking our climate, keeping us connected? What's new? What's next? to EDTAS Space Technologies. You are about to look up to a brighter sky. Well, good morning, folks. Uh, great to see you back, and for those that uh, didn't uh, in, I didn't introduce myself to you yesterday. Uh, my name's John, or J.P. Smith. Uh, I'm the uh, MC or steerer for uh, uh, the workshops and, uh, and the uh, proceedings today. Um, and it's great to, uh, again, kind of uh, see you. Uh, great work yesterday, and we look forward to uh, the results of our combined thinking over the course of today. So I was, I was musing, uh, as you do, um, and I think I told this story about my connection with, uh, uh, with the space industry, and, and so kind of I was going through my father's uh, bits and pieces, and, and of all things, I stumbled across this old document of his, uh, which was uh, a, a, a NASA document, um, kind of uh, looking at um, atomic standards, because he was involved in timing at, at Island Lagoon. And his, uh, I never understood kind of what that meant, uh, but he was essentially, you know, kind of the principal kind of uh, timekeeper for the uh, the, the um, uh, satellite dish at uh, at Island Lagoon. So I, I found this, and I, I was struck by this uh, uh, this little kind of uh, statement in the introduction, which kind of describes how you know world time synchronisation um, to about to only about 100 microseconds requires frequent clock comparisons and frequency comparisons over the globe, uh, you know, spanning distances and effort and funds and, and presently, uh, to a presently kind of, um, you know, achieve that type of precision. And, and of course, you know, it's amazing here we are now with, with uh, where we are with precision. Anyway, I, I was throwing this around with my mother and, and she, she kind of said, ah, yes, clock timing and everything. We used to have this delightful American man who would come and drop into our house uh, every time he was in Woomera. And uh, I said, go on, Mum. And, and she said, he was the master clock timer. And so he had a magic box, and he would set the clock time at Greenwich, and then his job was to fly round the globe, stopping at every tracking station to synchronise the time for that station, and then he'd go to each tracking station. So, you know, he'd tell the story because, of course, at Woomera, he would arrive, do Island Lagoon, then he'd come to our place for a beer. And, uh, and they'd kind of chat and talk kind of clocks and time. And he said, kind of, everybody was very jealous of him because uh, he had a spare seat on the plane for his clock box. And then he'd go around the world. And it just struck me, kind of, here we are now, still kind of, uh, you know, looking at precision timing and, and the importance of it everything, but it's amazing kind of the ingenuity and sometimes the adaption that we come up to to solve problems. I just think with that, with where we are and our solving problems today, uh, it's, a great, uh, it's a great kind of lead in. So with that, uh, and hopefully kind of, uh, you know, duly kind of inspiring you to, to think, um, think higher and beyond, let me go through the, through the necessary. 
I forgot. That's the box. That was that was supposed to be the uh, that was supposed to be the answer. Uh, look at it. What a glorious uh, what a glorious thing. Now we do that with a an app or something. Okay. Uh, just to remind you, if you've got uh, the magic uh, uh, master machines that control our lives, uh, just put those on silent. Uh, most people now have, have learnt the voyage of discovery to the bathrooms, but they are for, the, for those that are uh, new, out and round to the right, and if you press on, you'll see a big sign on a whiteboard that says toilets, arrow, follow that arrow, and then you'll pick up the trail. Uh, and, and again, just in, in, if we do need to evacuate, we are under the control of Woodside, so they will come and, uh, and usher us out. You will hear uh, the, the um, auditory noises and things. Um, we just gather here and we'll, we'll uh, follow their directions. And for Wi-Fi, I think most of you uh, uh, managed to kind of uh, get on yesterday, but it, this isn't in your, in your book, so if you do need to, to uh, take it down, edtaz well symposium 19 with a capital S. And a reminder that we are streaming, so we are streaming live, and the Twitter hashtag there is hashtag edtaz, uh, for, and follow uh, at Defence Science for those that uh, are, are tweeting out there. All right, that should get us there. Um, if, we, if you have any questions, we, of course, we'll, we'll continue with Slido. Um, so Slido, uh, go to slido.com, W612 will get you into Slido. We'll run Slido, but we'll also, uh, I think we'll also throw it to the audience as well, just for those that, that have a spontaneous question. So we'll probably use a, a mix of both over the course. So we'll run a, a microphone round as well as, uh, as take uh, questions from Slido. I'll hand over to Andrew, Andrew to introduce the first keynote. Thank you very much. Um, I must say, looking out here this morning, there's a few more tired-looking faces than there were yesterday. I don't know why that, what you've been doing last night. Um, and just, just build on the, the Slido thing. I think it's a wonderful idea. I, I work with large uh, technical teams, and getting people to stand up with a microphone and talk to you is hideously difficult. Uh, and isn't it a lot easier to do it anonymously over the phone? So that's good to see, and the questions we can see are, are working for that. Um, now, I was going to talk about two things quickly, so I didn't have a lot of time. Um, one was the, the dangers of predicting the outcome of space, which is what we're here to do. I just want to talk about his track record. And then actually just, just a bit of an essence of what we mean by emerging and disruptive technology. And hopefully I've got slides to do that. Uh, I think I do. Right. So uh, 40 uh, years ago, uh, there were lots of programs on television which promised me that my holiday home would look like that 20 years ago. Uh, in fact, I know of a program called Space 1999 had, had a whole bunch of people living on the moon, uh, or apparently moon left orbit, but that was a bit weird. Uh, <coughs> so something's going wrong with the predictions on space. You know, everybody was saying, well, we'll be on Mars, or we'll, be, we'll travel the solar system, we've gone into interstellar. So why isn't it happening? I mean, actually, the technology to do something like that isn't that difficult. Um, and I've got a feeling the answer is money. Uh, coming back to what I was saying yesterday about cost. Um, things happen in this world because everybody wants it to happen. So you all want to have communications in your hand, ergo it's happened. And that's because you're prepared to pay hundreds of dollars a year to have it. There are billions of us, uh, ergo it happens. Uh, the problem here is with a lot of the space exploration stuff that wants to happen um, is left to governments and they don't have enough cash to do it. So just bear in mind when we're doing predictions that the market for what you're doing, that there would be someone prepared to pay for it, then it will happen. If you go into, this would be wonderful if we did that, uh, and we were talking about collecting rubbish out of space, if nobody's got a market to pay you to do it, it's never going to happen. Um, so please bear that in mind when you're looking at um, your concepts today. Uh, the other thing is the, 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 why is it important for us, especially in defense, to explore emerging and disruptive technologies? And the two are in intimately linked. So I'm going to get a bit weird now uh, and talk about completely different technology to illustrate my point. Oh, come on. This one here. There we go. Right. Here we are, space technology. Uh, right. Back in 1809, 18, 
Andrew, 1908. Um, the uh, Royal Navy produced this thing, uh, Dreadnought. Uh, it was, I call it emerging technology, because uh, the new thing about it was the steam turbine. Steam turbine gave um, a significant more power to weight ratio uh, for ships, and it was completely new in that respect. It was demonstrated in the review a few years beforehand. To put it in this thing, it meant that this ship could be heavier and go, still go faster. It could go heavier, therefore, it could have more armor, and it could carry heavier guns, longer range. Instantaneously, this ship solved the problem of being able to shoot forward as almost the same power as it goes sideways, so all those formations were solved. It could outrun anything in the rest of the world, and if you did get close enough to hit it, it would bounce off. Um, a total uh, disruption to the marketplace that were ships. They cost a hell of a lot. Uh, so impactful, in fact, that there was an era called after it. Pre this was pre-Dreadnought, post this was the Dreadnought era. That was the super weapon uh, of the world, and everybody then had to invest to catch up in it. That resulted in the next 20, 25 years, the world spending most of its capital and talking of hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in building dreadnoughts. And they ended up with, by the time we went through the First World War, uh, with a few dreadnought battles. Uh, <coughs> um, but uh, most of the ships at that time were still pre-dreadnought mixture. Uh, and the 1920s and 30s was the big building phase where virtually all the money poured into it. Usual thing with super weapons, uh, the le legal bit came into it, trying to get treaties to restrict it and so on, just like you do today with nuclear weapons, or we're now undoing them. Uh, so that, that all was a, a complete change and, and an impetus that was because of a new weapon system. So it's important to know when that's going to happen. Alas. Come on. Didn't last long. The uh, aircraft developed. Uh, so the First World War, the aircraft was pretty low payload, low range, couldn't do much. Uh, it developed then through the 30s dramatically to become able to carry significantly heavy weapons and to the point where in 1940s the, the air power completely destroyed the concept of the battleship. Um, major ships were, were sunk, and actually all of the major capital ships in the Second World War were sunk by aircraft. Uh, <coughs> and the, the, this is um, Enterprise there, that actually the one that was missed at Pearl Harbor and took a big role in the rest of the war. After that, no more dreadnoughts were ordered. More were finished, finished off and built. I think the last one uh, was sailed in the 1946. Uh, that was the end of the era, completely wiped off the screen as a technology. All that investment in the 20s and 30s, gone. That's the power of disruptive technology, and this is what we're trying to avoid by trying to guess what is going on. And that's our, part, part of your job while you're here. It's real stuff. We're taking these concepts into studies in DST and evaluating what to do with them. All right, that's my preaching done. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker. Um, so we have a new conductor on the stage in space in Australia, and that is the uh, Space Agency. And uh, I have the pleasure of introducing to you to Anthony Murphett, a key member, a colleague of mine from, from the agency, who's going to talk to you next. So Anthony, if you'd like to come up, please. Button. Return. Return. Okay. Return. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure uh, to talk to you today. Um, as Andrew said, uh, we're, we're, we're almost the new kid on the block as it relates to the civil uh, space sector. Um, and it's a good opportunity here to talk about what we're doing in the, um, the civil space area, because importantly, one of the framings that we do, as, particularly as we talk around uh, the defence aspect, which is why you've all collected here today, that if uh, the agency does its job right, which is tasked to grow uh, the, the Australia's space industry, it provides a level of capability that can be used across various areas, including supporting um, the defence uh, enterprise. And the other side story I will uh, tell as well is that I was an uh, Army Reservist as a cavalry officer uh, many, many uh, years ago, and it was uh, interesting, even at that time, um, we had the luxury, well, actually we didn't have the luxury of using GPS, because they showed us the big box it was back then, then they took it us away uh, from us, and we had to use uh, map to ground, because if the GPS failed, um, it meant that we still had to read uh, maps at uh, 60 kilometres uh, an hour. But I think the reason I highlight that is when you talk about disruption, we do rely on 
things like GPS, and if that disappears in a defence context, you know, um, the armed forces need to work out what to do in that particular environment. Um, and uh, so that's a really important thing about what's being progressed over the next two days. And I also like the fact that in the working groups, I think one of the scoring uh, mechanisms that are there, it says something like the Australian Space Agency will high five the project and that's like top marks. And I do agree because one of the things we are doing in the agency is endeavouring to have fun. So to give some scene setting, um, and I apologise to some people that are in the audience that have probably seen these slides. The good news is I say different things even though the slides are different. But I, what I usually do when I talk about what we're doing with the uh, Space Agency is just to do some, a bit of a snapshot of what's happening. I gave this presentation last week, uh, and interestingly I said then I need to update this slide and I will need to uh, update this slide again because of uh, some of the events that happened over the weekend. But if we have a look at the rapid evolution of what's happening uh, in space and in commercial space, we've seen JAXA, which is the Japanese Space Agency, they've arrived at an asteroid, not only been there, they've landed on it, collected dust and they're going to return uh, to Australia. We've got Voyager 2, um, so this is for those in the crowd uh, in the 1970s uh, where these magnificent spacecraft were uh, shot off um, across the, the solar system. They've now gone into interstellar space and there's a beautiful Australian story there for us in that uh, where we've got the only couple of tracking stations in the world that can now talk to uh, Voyager 2. It takes a long time, but we still are the only uh, country that now can talk to that um, device. What I also like to reflect on is that more recently we've got a new uh, rover and apparatus on Mars through uh, NASA's InSight mission. Uh, Chang'e 4 is on the far side of uh, the moon. And then if we just look at the last uh, couple of weeks, we've got uh, Virgin Galactic who's now hit 89.9 kilometres with three people in their uh, space uh, craft. So they did have technically a passenger on board in the commercial uh, context. Uh, we've then had SpaceX who has undertaken the Crew Dragon, which is uh, the US now looking at commercial space flight and the fact that it's now docked with the uh, ISS and they're testing that, that's a big significant achievement in what we're doing with, uh, well, what the world is achieving in commercial space. And then I turn to Rocket Labs, not because we've got someone from Rocket Labs uh, in the audience. I know it's New Zealand, but the important thing around Rocket Labs is two parts, is it's disrupting the market. So it's had three launches. It's looking to launch again in the next uh, 10 days or so. But importantly, when they launched last year, there were two Australian CubeSats on that. So this is just showing the rapid evolution of what's happening in space and to try and think about the disruption about what that actually means is really important. We need to do that as the Australian Space Agency so we can look to grow our economy, create jobs and actually be at the forefront because Australia can do this. And if there's anything I leave the crowd uh, with is that as we go into space um, endeavours and we look to build, We've got the, uh, the expertise, the knowledge and the competitive advantage to do it and one of our jobs is to really uh, advocate that. So that's the scene setting part of our story. I'm now then going to turn into the space agency and if all this works right, I then pause and just show you a little clip about our logo because it just tells a little bit of our story about drawing on our past as we go um, to the future. So that's the Australian Space Agency and that's our logo and we really like to show and very proud of um, what our uh, brand represents. It recognises the 65,000 years 
of heritage uh, that we have with our indigenous culture, having the oldest astronomers uh, in the world and drawing on that expertise as we move uh, into the future. And I'll take this point to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we speak, their um, elders past, present and um, emerging. So that's a really important part of what we do uh, with the agency. And then as we go through to, you know, what is the agency and what do we do? Um, it was mentioned briefly in the, in the video, but our purpose is very clearly around growing a globally respected Australian space industry. It's about growing the broader economy, it's about improving the lives of us, uh, Australians, and importantly, inspiring. And for us to do that, people say, oh, well, you're late to the party. I sort of disagree in a way. There, it's true that we're sort of late, but where we've got the opportunity before us because space is undergoing this huge transformation with the evolution of technology, et cetera, which means for us to play our role, we've got the capability, but we really need that un, uh, to be underpinned by strong national and international engagement. And it's why forums like today are really important where the sector is coming together to talk through what these opportunities are and how we can um, uh, move forward. So I'm just going to touch just a little bit on what we've achieved, just for those that haven't uh, seen what we're doing. So we've been running for about nine months. Trust me, it seems a lot longer than, um, than nine months, and we've uh, you've really hit the ground running. But the things we're doing to, to achieve our, per uh, our, our purpose, what we're doing is we're engaging internationally. So we've signed agreements with the UK Space Agency, with the Canadian Space Agency, with the French uh, Space Agency and the, and the UAE. And these agreements are all about understanding where there are opportunities for us to engage and where our industry can uh, contribute to those uh, international missions. As we get up and running, we're working very closely with our uh, with industry partners, and you'll see on the slides that we've signed and worked closely with the likes of Airbus, Citael, Lockheed Martin, and there's um, additional ones that are coming uh, down the track. And what these um, agreements, as we call them, or statements of strategic intent, they're actually getting uh, articulating what are the opportunities that industry see uh, in Australia for our space uh, activities. And following on from Avalon last week, I think we'll see more of these um, coming forward because what's becoming really clear um, to the international community is Australia has a significant role uh, that we can play. And I'll talk about some of that as we, go f uh, as we go forward over these series of slides. But it's been really fascinating to tell some of the stories. And one of the great ones I usually tell we probably all saw Robonaut um, uh, last night. But when we say we've got this huge um, automation sector um, that is done in our mining, uh, in our mining sector, and the, the conditions they operate are very similar or can be translated into, this, uh, into the space domain, um, people pause and go, oh, actually, that's right. And then we start a conversation about what those opportunities are. I know that's on some of your work uh, today, but as we start to have those very clear conversations and articulate how Australia can play a role, we're not only getting interest, people want to come and play with us. And I think that's a really strong base in what we do. The other thing that has uh, happened uh, as we've got up and running is that we've reached 50 million people uh, in Australia. Um, those that are Australian know we've only got about 25 million, so now we say, well, we probably everyone's heard about us twice. It is a cumulative reach in that it's about the amount of times that people have heard about the Australian Space Agency. And if we rec uh, reflect on other programs I've run or if Dr. Megan Clark has worked in the various organisations, usually uh, for a significant organisation in the government context, you aim for five in a year, um, we hit 50 in eight months. So just to show that the appetite that is happening with space, as they say, space and dinosaurs inspires people, so it means you put the word space on it, um, people get engaged, but importantly, we have to stand behind it and deliver on um, what we've what we said is our um, purpose. The other things we've done is that we're working, we're a national organisation, it's about growing the sector across all of Australia, which means that we need to do that in lockstep with our state and territory uh, colleagues about where there are potential opportunities for investment, drawing on their capability that resides. And importantly, we need to work across government, which is why we work very closely with Defence, with DSTG, with CSIRO, with Geoscience Australia, 
our role as a coordinator, it is about providing advice on the civil space sector, but we can only do that when we work collaborative with our colleagues and we've got a range of mechanisms in place to allow us to do that and why it's, in, it's important we're here today to tell the civil side of the story to um, um, inform your thinking as you work on some of the defence challenges that are, that are coming forward. And the last bit that I'll touch on is that not only do we look at growing, growing the sector, we are, uh, have a regulatory responsibility. So everyone that wants to launch a CubeSat, if they want to look at uh, launch activities, those activities are managed um, through the Australian uh, Space uh, Agency. So I'm going to turn briefly um, just to our areas of competitive advantage and then I'm going to switch over to um, then what are the opportunities and I'm going to draw now the connections between some of the work that you're looking at in the, in the report that was uh, provided prior to this conference and then the working groups that you will do today and you'll see that very much some of the conversations you're having today are very much around where we see opportunities in the commercial space uh, sector and as I said earlier that if we do our job as the agency um, growing the sector and we've got a goal of growing to uh, tripling the size of uh, the civil space sector in Australia to $12 billion uh, and creating another 20,000 jobs by 2030, the way that we'll do that is through our area of competitive advantage. And if we do that, we provide greater capability for other areas of the economy, including um, defence activities. So the areas that um, I'll just touch on is the communication technologies and services. So this is the ground um, services uh, uh, segment. As there's increasing use of space, it means that more people need to communicate with space technologies. Australia has a great position in the Southern Hemisphere to be able to communicate uh, with uh, space assets. So that means that that's something we um, should explore. It also means that in a disruptive uh, sense, what do we do if those signals get uh, interrupted? I know in your paper there is um, discussions around uh, space situational awareness and debris monitoring. You've got further sessions on that today. But again, um, this is an area where we do have world-renowned uh, expertise. There are uh, companies in both here in Perth as well as uh, in Canberra that are looking at these particular issues. And as the paper outlines that you've uh, read over the last couple of days around things like space vents, there are still opportunities around permanent custody of items. And these are the type of areas where Australia can play a very significant role. So not only do we have technology capability, we also have our landmass, which means we can see a vast array of the sky to support the broader space situation, uh, the space situational awareness awareness uh, area. P&T, um, there were conversations yesterday about the uh, P&T and I joked about having a really big box um, called a GPS uh, many years ago when um, I was uh, in uh, the Armoured Corps, but importantly this is an important element and we use it every single day uh, that we undertake uh, particular activities. Um, and importantly, areas like Geoscience Australia is improving the resolution of the GNSS signal from what is around 10 metres and they'll get it down to 10 centimetres in um, um, across Australia through the use of uh, satellite-based augmentation system. And if you're in um, uh, an area with mobile reception, it'll get it down to around five to three centimetres. And that increasing resolution is going to be important, not just for finding where you are, but we can use it in a range of other areas of the economy around farming, um, uh, mining, et cetera, and supporting automation of things like automated uh, or autonomous uh, vehicles. Earth observations is also definitely another area where we've got a lot of capability. You'll be aware that Australia doesn't own its own uh, satellite, but one thing we're really good at is using the data out of um, satellites that come forward. Um, Organisations such as CSIRO and Geoscience Australia have done a lot of work in um, analysing data and piecing together, for example, Landsat data over 30 years. And that image there is a... Um, is a composite um, picture of 30 years of data from Landsat that shows where water has flown across um, Australia and from a drought um, um, a drought ridden land it's very important we understand those type of um, um, uh, opportunities where water is but importantly in the broader earth observation things we think in defence context being able to look at the land and identify assets and a range of other things is an extremely important um, tool um, in that uh, context. I always like talking about the robotics and autonomous uh, piece. I touched on that very briefly, but this is telling the story around uh, we have here in Australia some of the greatest capabilities around automation, uh, particularly in the mining sector. 
people around the world don't realise we have one of the longest um, auto, um, autonomous rail systems in the world. And when you tell people that internationally, that makes them pause and think. And then when you, uh, you start that conversation, then continue on and say, we've also got all these other activities we're doing in the resources sector, low light sensors, the use of robotics, and then they turn their mind to things like, well, hold on, we've got to go back to the moon, we've got to develop a lunar gateway, which will be a, um, a space uh, objects uh, in orbit around uh, the moon. Those technologies are directly applicable to challenges uh, in space, so there is a huge opportunity there. And then we have a big bucket that we call the R&D and LitFrog uh, technologies, which is really, this is the disruption piece. So where do we need to be uh, in the future? I've actually outlined areas where we're good now, but we can't um, shift our mind from where we want to be in 10 to 15 years. Well, it was actually out to 2040, which is a lot longer than, uh, longer than that. But we need to keep our mind on where is this technology going to grow? So this then comes into, what are we doing around quantum, um, quantum technologies and how does that apply to space? What are we doing around AI and uh, what does that mean for um, space technologies? And the example in your paper today um, it sort of does outline that you know, when we look at the bandwidth issues of trying to get data back into, uh, back, uh, back down to Earth, we were at the Pawsey supercomputer facility yesterday and just looking at storage of data, being able to select the data that we actually need rather than just having reams of data. To do that is going to require things like AI and other algorithms to identify how to better manage data. There's all of these things we need to think about now so we're positioned for the 10 to 15 year uh, horizon. And they're the type of things that we're, um, we're looking at. So. The things that I would just want to now highlight, so I've said where we're strong and so what have we actually seen over the last um, eight months? So what the first one that I all usually always talk about is the role of space in the broader economy. One of the reasons that the agency was set up is that space isn't just for space. Uh, space impacts on farming, it impacts on us just finding when we're going to our next meeting. It, um, it can help um, uh, shipping, it can help transportation. But much of the broader economy, uh, sorry, much of the broader community doesn't understand the role of space. And so we're telling that story and reinforcing how space can help um, what people um, do. And importantly, it's not, not expensive anymore. And there are examples in the document you read around like the likes of Fleet and Miriota, who are introducing very low cost technologies to help farmers, which is going to uh, improve um, the ways that they operate in their activities. But that's an important piece of what we do and we'll continue to, to do that. We are talking with international partners about the role of AI uh, in technologies, uh, our AI applications in their international missions. I've talked about the mining technology piece, which is um, a significant part. And the others that I'll touch on the bottom of the slide is that there is a growing part of space medicine, synthetic biology. So we're seeing now this, this um, space tourism uh, and commercial flight is getting closer. We've now got the Crew Dragon that is um, currently connected to the ISS. We've got Virgin Galactic that has reached 89.9 kilometres. People that are going to undertake commercial space flight are not going to be of the health that you see with the current crop of uh, astronauts, which means we need to understand the impacts of uh, space travel. We need to work out what it means when you travel in space. Australia has this huge um, capability with, um, with in, in the medical fields and we can apply that as it relates to um, space. And the last one I'll touch on just for opportunities is we know that as the agencies got up and running is that there is a growing appetite for launch and this is largely in the commercial sector where if there is really a commercial opportunity, um, you know, that is something that um, those companies can think about and what we will do is as the regulator work with them to ensure that um, those operations um, are safe. But we are seeing a large appetite around uh, the launch opportunities and that is really um, in the context of small, uh, of small launch. So when I'm not talking about a Saturn V launching from Australia, but I'm saying the, the 150 to 300 kilo payload of the areas where companies are currently uh, looking at, and I think some of that was explored yesterday. I know I'm at the end of my time, so just to give you a feel of where we're going to over the next six months, we'll get up and running um, in Adelaide, that's where our location will be, and then we'll operate nationally from um, that location. As I said earlier, the, um, the Australian Space Agency is a national organisation and we'll work with our state and territory uh, colleagues across the, across the nation to grow the, the space industry. 
some of the important things that we'll commence doing. Um, we'll, we're working on an investment plan as we go forward, but importantly, we'll start doing some technology road mapping to do some deep dives into the areas of opportunity to identify where Australia can play a role, and that will be done in consultation um, with the sector. So I'll pause um, uh, there, um, and I think we're gonna go to um, questions. So thank you very much. Um, folks, we do have a couple of microphones, so uh, if you have a question, just uh, just raise your hand and a microphone will come around and grab you. Um, uh, but uh, Anthony, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one from the um, from Slido first of all. So the Space Agency Charter specifically including, uh, excludes the defence space, um, yet obviously for a growing Australian space industry, defence space investment would be critical. Can the agency influence defence space investment decisions to facilitate the viability of the sector? That's the question. Um, yeah, so thank you for uh, the question. So the space agency is very much, it's around the civil space uh, activity and I, I don't think influence would be the, the, the right term that I would use, but I think what we are very cognizant of is we're, it's a close partnership with Defence as they undertake uh, their particular activities. And we've got a range of things and mechanisms in place to do that. We have um, essentially like standing committees, which are in our charter that um, talk about bringing government together to talk about the civil space uh, sector. And I think I go back to my earlier comment is around where we play a significant role is that if we do our job right around industry capability, um, it means that there is gra a greater capability for defence for them to draw on. But at the same time, we're talking you know, to DSTG, we're talking across defence about the things we're doing, and space situational awareness is one of those areas. And for example, we have um, a RAF uh, liaison officer sitting with us, because we know it's important that we work in lockstep as we go, um, go forward. So I think we've got a really positive relationship, and we're cognizant that that we need to continue to engage closely so we can bring um, and you know, sort of achieve our collective uh, goals. Yeah. Um, any questions from the, from the broader? I know it's the morning and everything like that. That's why I slide out. Oh, here we go. Phil, take it. Can I yell? You can yell, or Abby, if Abby's fast, she can get to you. Thanks, Anthony. Um, one of the things that UK Space Agency did early on was uh, coordinate with the uh, UK Funding Council that it kind of came out of uh, so that there was a, a panel and a stream for space-related uh, engineering projects. Uh, currently, ARC doesn't have a panel that that fits remotely inside. Um, it's kind of a, a zero-cost option in terms of just changing uh, the way that ARC looks at grants. Is there a, a possibility that you guys can have a conversation to have an ARC panel so that industry or academics could basically get a kind of a fair review of, uh, of, of grants? No, so thank you um, uh, for, the, for the question. Those that might know my past used to work at the ARC um, a little a little while ago, so I need to be very uh, cognizant that that's their programs, and so my comments will relate to our opportunity. So I'll start broadly and say that one of the opportunities as a coordinator that we do have as a space agency is that there's one space is now a priority, which means that we are having conversations with other programs about how we can leverage their capability. And one of the examples I use is Austrade, um, and so we have someone from Austrade again sitting with us. Um, to sort of, rec uh, they've got um, a huge international um, um, pool of people they draw on. When we looked uh, domestically as well, um, we, many of you probably know if we look at the CRC or the Cooperative Research Centres program, there's already a bid in, in play um, uh, there. As we turn to the ARC, yes, that's a conversation that we have, but again, um, that will be you know, with um, at, the, at the ARC's discretion. But I know that Megan has reached out to the ARC and started, started conversations as we, as we go forward. But we will continue to look at what those opportunities are. And I think as we grow, I think we can see there is this growing appetite for engaging in space, and space is touching on so many parts of the economy, so I think it's a, a pretty bright future for us as we look to coordinate across, um, uh, across government. Great. Um, I'll take another question from Slido here. Uh, it's a good question. Um, how do you see our Indigenous Australians potentially benefiting 
from emerging technologies such as space. I mean, we borrow the branding and, and it's important. Um, thoughts? Yep. So uh, one thing, yeah, we're very cognizant that we you know, we honour and respect our um, our indigenous community as we as we go forward. Um, we've you know, we've we've started with the brand, and we're looking at what those opportunities could be. So some of the thoughts we're having is just internally, how do we support things like indigenous um, internships? So that's early on at the moment. We we are, these are the type of thinking that we're doing, but we're also engaging with. Um, yeah, some of the the community that are undertaking work with um, the, uh, the in the space sector, and I know there's some companies, for example, working in um, in in Arnhem Land about telling their stories through augmented reality and how can we, um, one, um, support those communities to tell those stories in the space context. There's a lot of opportunities out there and I think we're only just touching the surface of what we can do. But again, yeah, the other thing we, we do say is if you've got ideas, do reach out to us because we're always open to ways that we can um, sort of incorporate and um, appropriately um, honour our Indigenous communities. Any other uh, questions from the... Yes, up the back there. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the uh, formation of the investment plan and the strategy, and presumably that will revolve around a few things, including, broadly speaking, those six areas that you highlighted, plus the engagement with the states and territories. Could you just elaborate on so the timescales for those consultations with the sector and how that will proceed? Yeah. So with the, the strategy, you know, that, that's something that will need to be considered by government, so I can't really comment on um, that part, other than to, uh, there's two things that I will uh, draw out, is that I think one thing we've said early on is that we sort of need to, there's a role in setting a long-term vision about how the sector can grow so people can articulate and industry can sort of get a feel about where Australia can play um, its role. On time frames, one of the important things to uh, to look at is the road mapping exercise that I that I mentioned on the slide, and because they're going to be the key parts of how we work out where Australia can play a role uh, in the future, and that will be over the next year. Um, we've got Ord um, from the team who is here, uh, who is here, is looks after um, program capabilities, but is essentially a fancy way of saying she's our chief technology officer to make sure when I've got a cup, I don't think it's a satellite. Um, but she will lead a lot of the, um, the, the technology road mapping. They'll be done over the year. It'll be done with industry. It'll be done with our colleagues from CSIRO and Defence, et cetera, because for us to get the road mapping right, the you know, consultation will be key to achieving that particular um, uh, outcome and we'll come out later this year with uh, more details. So if you're not registered on our newsletter, don't follow us on Twitter and other bits and pieces. The newsletter we do every fortnight, that is usually our key mechanism to let people know what we're, what we're doing. Folks, I, I will have to uh, draw it because we need to press on. Anthony, are you staying around? Is what you're I'll be here uh, in and out. Unfortunately, when I end up in another state, I get dragged um, over a lot of places. So I will be here, but I will be at the dinner right. again tonight as well. So I look forward to engaging with everyone. So. Folks, we uh, thank Anthony for his time this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Dale, over to you for the first panel. Thanks, JP. So, what a great start to the, to the morning to help kick us off in the, in the right direction. So, thank you on, on my part from the organisers, uh, Anthony. So, now we're turning to our third panel session, and the theme of this one is comprehensive space domain awareness, and, and Anthony did allude to that in his talk. So, with no further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage Travis Bessel. Uh, um, I think he is first up. Oh, Phil, you're up first. Sorry. I can't read, obviously. Welcome, Phil. Thank you, folks. Uh, so, my name's Phil Bland. I'm at uh, Curtin University in the, oh, hello, um, in the Space Science and Technology Center. Uh, we have a team of 15 uh, staff, engineers and scientists, and 16 HDRs. Uh, we were actually on all of the missions that Anthony mentioned, except Voyager, we were a little, it's quite a venerable science team now, uh, plus a couple of others, Bethy Colombo in the last six months, which launched to Mercury, 
and, uh, and Cyrus Rex, which is currently orbiting the asteroid Bennu. That's a NASA sample return mission. Uh, always a lot of fun to be on missions. You get to go and see the things launch, which is fantastic. And, uh, and you get crazy emails first thing in the morning, uh, some incredible science discovery that you can't tell anyone about until the major papers come out. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. It's a big deal for us to translate our innovations into industry. And I'm going to tell you about a project that we're doing with partners Lockheed Martin in SSA and how I think that flows through into the future of, uh, of SSA. Um, so why do we need it? Well, uh, you can read some of those bullet points yourself, but I think the easiest way of describing it is uh, we don't really realize how much we need something until someone takes it away. So imagine if we, if, if we lost air traffic control. What we're after with SSA is space traffic control. Um, the, er, the thing everyone's afraid of is the Kessler syndrome, where you get a kind of runaway uh, chain reaction that we basically lose LEO. Um, so it seems to me that dabbling with that is a really bad idea. Um, I think the potential market for SSA is basically equivalent to the potential market for air traffic control if you took it away and wanted to buy it again. Um, I'm really chuffed that, uh, that this session is comprehensive uh, to space domain awareness because that's basically my uh, interest in this. Um, the current paradigm has always been a kind of a small number of exquisite sensors, what we call exquisite sensors, so really high-end uh, telescopes coupled with kind of advanced uh, modeling um, to propagate those orbits forward in time. And the, the kind of default now is the uh, space surveillance network, which gives us the uh, space track catalog. So if you want to know where a satellite is, you get a space track. Um, that has uh, around 20 exquisite sensors that According to my Lockheed colleagues, uh, there may be more, uh, and, uh, and about 40 radar systems, and then some really nice uh, data fusion there. Um, but what that buys you is space track, and space track is really far from perfect. We wouldn't be having this conversation if it worked really well. Um, you're frequently uh, arc minutes off in where you expect that satellite is going to be, um, and it, you know, and a, a frequent situation is that it's so far off that, uh, okay, is it actually the satellite that I think it is, or have I, have I lost track of one? Um, so uh, how do we do it? So the, when I first got into this, I was surprised that, that those existing solutions um, didn't seem to fit the problem. Uh, you're trying to image a really large dynamic population across the whole sky. It's not like astronomy where you know, the stars don't move. These things are moving. Uh, they've got propulsion. Uh, you're trying to keep track of them all. And you're using narrow angle sensors to do that. Um, how on earth are you ever going to do that when, uh, when a one to two meter telescope has a field of view less than a degree? Um, so I felt like, okay, the need here is for a wide angle detector you still need sensitivity. Um, you still want to get to arc second resolution. Um, you want to be able to generate a large catalog that can restart itself if you lose it for some unfortunate reason. And it's got to be persistent. You want to be able to image those objects or detect those objects, determine their orbits multiple times a day, and then uh, get that data back very quickly, tens of seconds at worst, so that users can, can, can make rapid decisions. Um, my lead into this comes from the Desert Fireball Network, and that, that's a facility that we built. It's basically a network of small uh, cots, um, parts, um, really tough uh, observatories, all looking at the sky, trying to track fireballs as they come through the atmosphere. The entire network works together. All those uh, cameras are taking uh, images uh, to sub-millisecond precision across the network. So basically the whole thing clicks off and on um, at that sort of timing. Uh, and we're just in the process of expanding that to a global facility. So what I'm after here really is a global SSA facility. Uh, what I'm convincing you of, hopefully, is that the logistics to that are actually really simple because we've already done it for, for a blue sky uh, project looking at fireballs. Um, so these are colleagues of mine uh, putting up uh, one of our fireball observatories, not quite as quick as this uh, to put it up. We can put up two or three of those in, uh, uh, in a day um, and basically leave them out in the bush for two years. You don't have to touch them. 
um, we connect to them all remotely, and, uh, and they do all the data processing on board. So the Fire Opal concept takes that further. Um, those observatories are tougher. They've got a lot more computing on board. The sensors are more sensitive. Um, the benefit here is that you get around some of the standard problems with, uh, with optical SSA. Because it's global, you don't have a terminator issue. It's essentially always on. Uh, some portion of it is always imaging the sky. Um, it's disruption tolerant. It's a big network. Um, and the, and what we, it's persistent. You, you're seeing those objects all the time. You're picking them up uh, all the time. Um, we kind of get around the issue of, okay, how do you get precise orbits with, uh, with low-cost sensors um, by doing triangulation? So uh, again, it turns out, no big surprise, um, that if, okay, you might have a $10 million telescope looking at that one object, you can get an arc second uh, precision on that, on the angles. Um, turns out if you look at it from three different angles, um, you can get equivalent precision from much cheaper sensors. So triangulation, a good thing. Um, and uh, we get calibrated results in seconds. So uh, this is an example of, of what some of that data looks like. This is uh, 10 minutes from one observatory. Uh, those observatories are working together, tiling each uh, portion of sky so that we get triangulation. You can see the geo belt there and then some Leos crossing that. And this is data from, uh, uh, from Halley Ackler. We did a little test up there with one of our cameras to see how much benefit we got uh, from the top of the mountain. Uh, the little thumbnail there, basically what the camera is doing is detecting that um, uh, satellite, uh, doing all the astrometry for every image, and then giving us a light curve for every observation as well. And that happens. Uh, there's a five second exposure and then five seconds after that, all of that processing happens and gets blipped to the server. Um, performance is, I'm really happy with it. Uh, we get um, all of those, all of that data in seconds. We can see Leo, Mio, and Geo. Uh, photometry to a few percent and orbit predictions match our future observations to within arc seconds, which as I say, um, isn't necessarily the case for, for space track. Um, the tests that we've currently done, we're at about, uh, shortly we'll have 20 observatories in Australia. Um, that lets us calculate what a, a global facility would look like, the equivalent to the, um, the fireball network. Um, we'd be imaging 100,000 square degrees every 10 seconds. Um, we'd get 95% of the catalog of kind of, we're looking at, you know, satellites, active and inactive and large debris uh, every 12 hours and 50% uh, in we'd be picking it up again in less than two hours uh, so that's a really nice that's basically 50% in less than two hours is the uh, design goal for this um, I was really glad that uh, so that was our concept that's what we came up with um, I was glad to find this by in a in a white paper from the Institute for Defense Analysis last year, um, where they said an emerging new paradigm, uh, growing rec recognition that the entry point for SSA need not be based on exquisite technology. Um, having a distributed network with many lower quality sensors, uh, we can rival the U.S. network like that. Uh, that will not only provide adequate SSA capability, but also augment sens sensors affected by weather impact and offer redundancy. Um, so nice to get a giant uh, nonprofit supporting your idea. Um, I think really that whether it's us or anyone else, what we really need in SSA is basically a kind of a foundational data set that is good enough that then all of that exquisite information can feed into um, that would allow us to do rapid queuing of those very expensive, beautiful sensors. Uh, and for conjunction warning, I'm a planetary scientist, um, there's an asteroid hazard scale called the Torino scale, um, which lets us kind of calculate, okay, how hazardous is this asteroid versus this asteroid? What is its probability of hitting the Earth? And the way that planetary science responds to that is throwing more and more assets at it until you've narrowed down the error ellipse and you can say, okay, it's absolutely uh, not a problem. And so uh, I kind of like that idea for SSA, if we could do, you know, reporting in tens of seconds, um, you were able to do that with your exquisite assets and really give people um, enough warning to move their 
satellites around. So I'm going to leave it there because I'm over time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. And now Travis, sorry, now Travis from DST can come up and give his talk. Thank you. Good morning all, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today about space domain awareness, or known as, also known as space situational awareness. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about what I think space domain awareness is. And it's the, uh, in my opinion, it's the comprehensive knowledge of space objects and the ability to detect, track, understand and predict their future location. Now it's no secret. We all depend on space to perform our day-to-day -day lives, and defence recognises the importance on, sp on space as we are heavily reliant on the assets for comms, PNT, and ISR. So SSA is fundamental to the conduct of all space operations and to ensure that access to space. So how do we currently perform SSA? Uh, Phil touched on it before. The US uh, currently manages space object catalogue, which contains about 19,000 objects. The graphic I present here um, shows it's one obtained from the NASA Orbital Debris Program Office in Houston, Texas, and it shows the growth in the uh, population of space objects uh, from the launch of Sputnik back in 1957. Now, all of these objects are objects that we can currently track given um, the technology that we have. They're roughly sort of softball size, 10 centimetres in size and larger. They span from LEO out to GEO regimes. Out of that 1,900, there's about 1,800, uh, sorry, 19,000, there's about 1,800 or less than 10% that are actually operational, as in doing their job that they were meant to do when they were put up there. The rest are spent rocket bodies, defunct satellites or junk. Junk that's hurling around at about seven kilometres a second. So in the debris uh, population here, you'll notice two large spikes, uh, one in 2007, this is where the uh, uh, Chinese performed an ASAT test on their own defunct weather satellite. It was successful, but they put an extra 3,500 objects uh, into the uh, space um, debris catalogue. And in 2009, there was another jump, and that was due to an accidental collision between a Russian satellite and Iridium satellite. Now, in this case, the Iridium satellite was still active. Uh, if the US used to provide warnings uh, on potential collisions uh, at that point in time, but due to the sheer number of warnings and, in the, and the inaccuracy of the data uh, that they were providing, they actually decided to stop it before this collision, and uh, this is a result of what happened. So it just uh, is one example of why we need to improve our SSA. As I said before, this plot shows the objects that we can currently track. So that's sort of 10 centimetres and greater. Models suggest that there is a lot more objects smaller than this. So from one centimetre to 10 centimetre, they predict there's about 700,000 objects. From one millimetre to one centimetre, there's potentially 170 million objects out in space. One millimetre doesn't sound like much, but it was touched on yesterday that the ISS managed to get a chip in its window from a fleck of paint. So how do we go about constructing this catalogue of space objects? Well, first we need to detect them. Phil gave an, an awesome insight into the uh, stuff that they're doing uh, in this area, but unfortunately there's no silver bullet, there's no sensor that can detect every space object out there. Typical sensors we use are optical telescopes and radars. So the US have a space surveillance network, they both have ground-based and space-based telescopes, and they have mechanically steered phased array radars to detect all these objects. Technology improves over the years, and recently there's been these exquisite sensors that are developed, one of which is the Space Surveillance Telescope. It's currently being relocated to Australia and due to turn on in 2022. And the Space Fence is another exciting sensor. It's been developed by Lockheed Martin. It's an S-band sensor, and it'll be on uh, Kwajalein. And uh, when that's turned on, uh, which I believe is uh, later this year, uh, they claim it will be able to detect objects down to two centimetres. So this is impressive. Um, unfortunately, these sensors are very expensive, and due to this, it typically means there's only one or few of them. So there's currently a lot of research happening in the area of non-traditional sensors, sensors that we don't typically use uh, to detect space objects. Curtin University, looking at wide field of view to persistent surveillance. Uh, there's also the area of passive radar, where instead of actually transmitting, we use trans uh, illuminators of opportunity, so TV signals or radio broadcast signals 
that are already out there and listen for these reflections. So uh, Stephen Tingay um, is presenting on this tomorrow, I believe, where they're using the MWA as a, uh, as a passive radar sensor. Uh, Space-based um, sensors are uh, another exciting uh, opportunity and looking at uh, smaller form factor satellite, satellites. So instead of your large satellites, looking at CubeSats and seeing how they might be able to perform SSA, uh, the benefit of doing that is you can have large constellations provide more persistent surveillance. So Innovor and Hero Robotics are, uh, are a couple of companies that are looking into that. Uh, Western Sydney Uni, uh, Greg Cohen is up after me. He'll be talking about some exciting research in neuromorphic sensors as opposed to your typical optical sensor. And then there's EOS, electro-optic systems. They're using lasers um, to get very accurate range information and even investigating whether it's possible to perturb an orbit using a high-powered laser. So there are lots of exciting stuff here happening in Australia, and these are just a few that I've mentioned. And internationally, there's a lot going on as well. There's commercial businesses that are deploying sensors all around the globe and actually selling SSA data as a service. So it's a different business model. Uh, it's touched on yesterday, the idea that we don't necessarily have to own the sensors anymore to obtain the SSA data. So what's next? Um, I don't know, I'm excited. I'm keen to see what the next uh, phenomenology comes out. But one thing I do know is that there's gonna be more and more data coming from these sensors. So what we do with that data is extremely critical. This leads me to the next slide. So once we've detected the space object, that's one part of the puzzle. The next part of the puzzle is actually being able to track it, construct an orbit, add it to the catalogue, start to understand it with the hope that we can predict where it might be in the future. And I feel this graphic here really puts things into perspective. So I mentioned the exquisite sensor before, SST. Uh, it's a, the Space Surveillance Telescope. It's going to be here in Australia. Uh, it's a three metre mirror F1 telescope, curved focal plane, impressive sensor. I was fortunate enough to work at AFRL for some time and managed to visit the sensor just down the road uh, where, and seen it in action. This slide here shows a snapshot of one night's worth of data from the SST when it was based in Socorro in New Mexico. Every dot on this uh, slide is a space object. All the black dots are dots that we're currently correlating to the space object catalogue, so the 19,000 objects that I touched on before. All the blue dots are space objects that we can't correlate. They're, called as a, they're, they're known as uncorrelated targets, UTCs. Now these are space objects, we can detect them, we can see them, but trying to actually track them and construct an or orbit out of them is a very difficult problem, and there's a number of reasons why it's, uh, why it's such a hard problem. So the algorithms we use currently contain a lot of assumptions or simplifications. Assumptions in what, what the object might look like, assumptions in our physics models on how they propagate, and these assumptions are necessary to, uh, due to our limited computational resources and uh, the need to have that timely information uh, coming to us. But as this improves over the future, we should be able to improve our algorithms and try and actually have higher fidelity models to have more accurate SSA data products. This will assist in the data association problem. So we get more and more sensors, we get more and more data. We'll be able to actually um, improve our estimation of this, the blue dot from this night corresponds to the blue dot in the next night. And we can look at characterization information. So actually using the sensor, some different information from the sensor to determine what the object might look like, what shape it is, and how then be able to uh, ingest that into our higher fidelity models of how it propagates. Just when we think we've nailed all that, objects can maneuver. <laughs> so uh, Paddy sort of mentioned on it yesterday about some of the new technologies um, that have come through in electronic ion propulsion. Uh, it's different to your chemical thrust. It's uh, mu typically much smaller, but can operate for long periods of time. So to throw this into the mix, we need to add that to our models and be able to uh, assume that the, the um, objects may manoeuvre and in the future, they may be able to manoeuvre a lot more than what they can now. So, in, yeah, so there's some of the barriers that we're facing um, in the current problem of SSA. Um, as we progress further, uh, I wonder what the space domain is going to look like in 2040. Um, there's a figure here that looks at how, my, how many launches are going to happen in the next few years. So we're talking large numbers by uh, 2023. Uh, but what numbers will be in 2040, I've got no idea. There's uh, more and more companies intending to put more constellations, more formations up there. SpaceX have already submitted applications to the FCC to launch about 12,000 objects in the, uh, the not-too-distant future. 
So that's going to cause more problems. We need more sensors, more data, high fidelity models to maintain track of all these targets. Then what happens if an issue such as Kessler syndrome comes into play, it might wipe, wipe out complete orbital regimes. So then there might be other areas where we might be putting space objects. Let's talk of using the Lagrange points. Um, we need to make sure that we have the sensors to observe these, uh, these regimes, make sure we maintain custody of the objects and be able to track them. Debris removal is another area of active research. Um, actually, there was a recent CubeSat that went up called uh, Remove Debris at University of Surrey in the UK. Really cool YouTube clip where they actually deployed a net to capture another object and then a drag sail to drag that object uh, back into Earth's atmosphere and burn up. So who knows what other ideas they might be able to uh, do here, but, uh, but yeah, active debris removal is something that's happening. Um, we touched on space law and regulations to make sure everyone's behaving in space yesterday. Uh, one thing I do know that there's no point putting regulations in place if we can't enforce them. Uh, so, and to do that, we need comprehensive domain awareness uh, to do this. And last but not least, I'll finish up, is human travel. So again, Elon Musk announced his idea of space travel from one side of the globe to the other in about 40 minutes. Sounds like a great idea, but if we start putting more and more humans in space, then it's critical that we need the highly accurate, timely information uh, to ensure that space is, space, space is safe. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. And uh, as he alluded to, we've actually had a last minute change to our, our program. Milica couldn't um, make it, unfortunately. And so Greg has kindly agreed to step in and give us a talk on his capabilities. So Greg Cohen, um, wherever you are, lost you. Um, can, if you can come and have it, let us know your stuff. So, hello everyone, I'm Greg Cohen. I'm from the newly formed International Center for Neuromorphic Systems at Western Sydney University. And I'm gonna give you a bit of a different talk today because I'm gonna talk about sensing primarily because that's what you need to do domain awareness. You need good sensors. And I work with biologically inspired sensors. So it's going to be a bit different. Um, prepare yourselves for that. There's going to be sponge lava involved. <laughs> but ultimately, the reason is because I don't know what's going to happen in terms of space domain. I don't know what's going to happen in terms of what we need from sensors. But I do know that biology has solved a lot of problems already. And biology is all about keeping up. It's about survival. It's about changing as the problem and the solution changes along with you. So if we look at how biology solves problems and how biology applies sensing ideas and processing, we can get a roadmap for what we might have to do and what we might have to think about in terms of sensors. So I have a little bit of street cred in this regard because I work with these biologically inspired cameras, which work more like an eye than a conventional camera. And I use these for real world tasks on telescopes to track satellites. And the reason they work well is these cameras, they don't have frames or exposure times or have saturation effects or motion blur. The pixels in these cameras only sense changes. So point one of these cameras at a static scene and you get no data out. When something changes in the field of view, only the affected pixels send you information. So you get the stream of events, and that lets you do things with these cameras you can't do with a normal sensor. For example, when you're pointing up at the sky, most of the pixels are empty, you get no data out of them, so you get lower data rate. When something enters the field of view, only the affected pixels send you information, and you can start tracking it really fast within microseconds of seeing it. And you can imagine the ramifications of this. We can do we also have a high dynamic range, so we can do these tasks during the day just by changing the sensing paradigm. The problem, of course, is you now need a completely different approach to sensing as a result. So when you start changing and looking at how biology does sensing, it changes the whole paradigm. Instead of pulling information out of a camera, you wait for the camera to push information to you. So if you look at what we want from sensors, you know, biology gives you some good idea. Well, what do we want? We want robustness to noise. You know, take voice recognition. In the last few years, it's gotten much better. Google, Siri, Alexa, they're good at recognizing our voices and transcribing it. But try to use it in a noisy environment. Try to use it in an airport or on the side of the street. It doesn't work very well, but that's a task that we do very well. It's the cocktail party problem. So when you put something in space, for example, or you're looking at space, that's a difficult environment. It's a harsh environment. It's, gonna, it's noisy. There's wide variations of conditions, both in terms of light intensity and just in terms of operating conditions and it's not gonna get any better. So biology has solved some of those robustness to noise issues. They're low power as well. I can have breakfast in the morning, 
and I can outperform most sensors and systems in terms of my ability to detect, my situational awareness, and my ability to make decisions. Clearly, biology is doing it on a simpler and more easy, or it's taking a simpler path to doing it. An important point is also data rate. We want low data rate, but we want high information content. Right? This is my issue with current sensors to some degrees. We're all about fidelity. We want more resolution, more data. But often, if you, crap, if you capture more data, you're capturing more information, but a lot more noise and a lot more redundant information. And the problem used to be solvable by just throwing more processing power at it, more resources, more storage. But we're getting to the end of Moore's law. We simply can't squeeze any more transistors into a piece of silicon. So we need to start figuring out how to process more efficiently, starting taking as much of the processing as we can get and put it into the sensor. We also want these sensors to be autonomous. We want them to be able to send only relevant information. If your task for your sensor is just to look for satellites, a yes, I saw that satellite contains the same information of a picture of that satellite. And that's if you have slow links, difficult links, complicated links, uh, data communication links, that is. These are important points. Biology also gives you some interesting other abilities. Self-calibration. You can go from a dark room to a light room. You don't have to sit down and adapt for 10 minutes. We also don't have to recalibrate our vision every day. Self-repairing as well. Biology fixes itself. And well, present company excluded, graceful degradation. You know, you take a sensor like one of these event-based cameras, because the pixels are independent, you lose one pixel, that's it. That pixel stops working. It doesn't affect the rest of the sensor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a biological roadmap for sensor development by looking at how biology has solved these problems. And we start off with a humble squid larva. No, sponge larva, sorry. Now, sponge larvas are really interesting because they have photoreceptors, but they have no neurons, no brain whatsoever. They're essentially a sensor. They're a photodiet. So they react to light, but they do nothing at the source with that information. If you go up the evolution train of it, you get to things like box jellyfish. They're really interesting. There's not a whole lot going, in, going on inside a jellyfish, but they have eyes. They have relatively complex eyes, and they can see and they can navigate. So box jellyfish actually can move towards and away from targets. They don't have much of a brain, but they have processing at the sensor, and that just gives them an enormous leap in what they can accomplish and what they can do. So having a bit of processing in the sensor is already an enormous jump. The next step up is specialized eyes. I don't know if you know this guy, the mantis shrimp, the fascinating animal. We are trichromatic. We have three color receptors in our eyes. The mantis shrimp has 16. Now, interestingly enough, they don't mix those colors like we do. But the point is it has 16 specialized sensors to detect what it needs to detect. And that gives it a whole bunch of abilities. These are highly specialized eyes for the task they're trying to do. If you go one level up, you start looking at something like honeybees. These are systems of systems. Maybe this is what we want for, space, for sort of space situation awareness. Bees, autonomous, small, low power, highly maneuverable. They have surprisingly good eyes. In fact, they have four eyes. They can see UV. Fly bees will go out, find a flower, come back, and communicate that information to other bees. Coordinate, and you get this emergent behavior because they're used social animals. Systems of systems that are autonomous that solve tasks and exploit resources around them. And then, of course, if you go one level up from all of that, you get to us, mammalian vision. And this is true domain awareness. It's what we want. Complex sensors, sensor fusion, expectation, learning, adaption. This is what we're trying to get to. So biology has laid out this roadmap for us. This is essentially how we can approach sensing and do it better. The question I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to leave it as an open-ended question, is where do we sit on that roadmap currently with sensors? And where do we need to be in order to do proper domain situational awareness, both in space and in any way where you need to sense information? So a bit of a different approach to all of this, but I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Greg. Um, really interesting talk. So next we get uh, our industry perspective, and hopefully Derek's. I haven't had a chance to catch up with Derek. Oh, there he is. Um, and he's from BA Systems to give us industry perspective. Good morning. You know, I have, I have two claims to fame when it comes to space. Firstly, I was about four months old and watched the moon landing. And secondly, I managed to wake up in Woomera once, and that's a story for an entirely different day on that one. So I am relatively new in the, in the space domain, but so I want to go back and have a, a look at this from sort of the start. And a typical understanding of space situational awareness is the monitoring and tracking of orbiting based space objects about debris and traffic management. But let's look at the term comprehensive space domain situational awareness more closely. Comprehensive 
including or dealing with all or nearly all elements or aspects of something. For the space domain, we can limit it to space, but I think we need to take a broader context for situational awareness and include the ground and the counter space elements if we're really referring to the space domain. For situational awareness, the perception of elements and events with respect to time and location, then importantly, the comprehension of their meaning and the projection of future status. So I want to take that broader view for comprehensive space domain situational awareness. The desire includes real-time ubiquitous commander control. An example is DARPA's Hallmark program and BA Systems is involved in this. In terms of the current state of the technology for detection of objects, we're limited to around 10 centimetres. Separation of resolution of objects is not such an issue at the moment, but may become one. And the continuity of observation is a limitation if we take as the context an individual country's ability to do SSA. As such, United States and Australia have a situational awareness partnership, which is valuable to both of us. Then with any ground-based systems, there are limitations to the atmosphere, we know of observation of field of view for a given sensor, and distributed systems, as Phil mentioned, can certainly help these limitations. Alternatively, if we consider space-based observations, there are other limitations driven by primarily size, weight, and power. They affect the sense capability and they affect the communications. And again, efforts are underway to reduce these limitations. So the comprehensiveness of space domain situation awareness is driven by these limitations and similar limitations for situation awareness of space domain ground elements. And the Noetic paper is quite good in covering some of these issues and developments. Limitations with the collection naturally lead to limitations with other aspects of the process, integration, interpretation, and ultimately exploitation. Each of these process elements also has own limitations. And whilst more data is generally beneficial, more data can also lead to more ambiguity if we don't properly understand the uncertainty in each data set and fuse the data in the right way, spatially and temporally, to reduce and not increase the ambiguity. Now, classic SSA places emphasis on high location accuracy, but this can be a barrier to new sensors, contributing to catalog, and it may be that revisit rate is more important in some scenarios. But what do we really want when it comes to situational awareness? In broad terms, we want an understanding of capability and intent, the comprehension of meaning and the projection of future status. For classic SSA, this may be the likelihood of collision of objects in space. We're okay at that. There are lots of objects, but their orbits and hence behavior are reasonably understood, and Travis, Travis touched on that. We don't necessarily know full capability from a defense perspective, but for classic SSA, that's less critical. In the defense context, though, our goal of a good understanding of capability and intent is becoming more difficult as maneuverability and payload capability increases. So in terms of trends in the near term, in Australia we've seen industry recognised as fundamental input to capability, a recognised need for the rest of less reliance on other nations, and hence greater sovereignty in our solutions. Equally, though, we recognise the value of allies, and so sovereign solutions that are interoperable with our coalition partners and often right five eyes. In reality, it's, it's more than that. We're in a time of great power struggles, but also the challenges of non-state actors. Historically, space has been the realm of large investments, the US, Soviet Union, Russia, the European Union, now China. We've seen more from India, and so we will do, and we do see great power struggles in space. Non-state actors don't necessarily have the capability to exploit space as yet, but they may work and recognize the importance of ground assets in the space domain. Economically, there are projects of money identified in the integrated investment plan for SSA. The entry costs are diminishing, and this means more objects and smaller objects. And socially, we are much more reliant as civilians on the use of space. And this raises international question, interesting questions on international humanitarian law and the peaceful uses of outer space. Technically, we're seeing rapid launch capabilities, advanced manufacturing, greater autonomy, capability for size, maneuverability, and stealth technologies. And all of these will impact on the comprehensiveness of space domain situational awareness. Looking ahead to the much longer term, this is fraught with danger. You know, we see the impetus transfer to private corporations. And this will necessitate a good regulatory environment to task for the Australian Space Agency. Do we need the equivalent of the International Maritime Organisation or International Civil Aviation Organisation? And again, this is touched on in the Noetic paper. Will individuals get involved? You know, you'd have to see that as unlikely at the moment, but when we look at unmanned aerial vehicles and how quickly they've been adopted and applied by individuals, who knows? Unlikely, yes, but I suspect few people guessed UAV correctly. 
possible counter to cooperation for SSAs as resources diminish will we see conflict arise over extraterrestrial resources. Longer term in the technical context, you know, more law end, computing power stagnate. We may see in orbit manufacturing capability. And so again, the SSA task becomes more complex. If we make progress on communications, that will certainly change many things as we improve our understanding of dark matter and dark energy. Again, what will that mean? Who knows? Brain machine interfacing can impact in terms of visualization and control. And can be, there'll be plenty of black swans, unpredictable, and the gray rhinos are predictable but neglected along the way. So given these trends, predictions, what gaps do we need to bridge? Well, there's always a need for the physics to build new understanding and then the engineering to apply this. The ability to detect smaller objects, better understanding of multi-body physics, space weather, improved communications, large data set processing, astrodynamic models, et cetera, et cetera. But, and with due respect, because it's not always true, there's an old saying that generals always tend to fight yesterday's war, which then makes me wonder, what can we expect with space domain situational awareness? especially when we consider rapid launch, on-orbit and advanced manufacturing, cyber threats and non-state actors. I wonder, do we even know what we're looking for? Do we think AI is going to find what we don't know we're looking for? Traffic management is one thing, but that's hardly comprehensive. So I want to digress slightly and give an example from a recent article by Ewan Levick. Given an example from you and Larry, relevant to disruption. The article was published by the Australian Naval Institute in February 2009. Jung talks about how large organisations struggle to adapt when innovation challenges their internal structures. Other authors with the material related to this include Clayton M. Christensen, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma Why New Technologies Cause Great Companies to Fail. And Jung gives an example of below threshold conflict activities. For example, if invading soldiers, are the responsibility of the ADF, and illegal fishing the responsibility of another organisation who solves the problem of invading fisher people. And what does this all mean for comprehensive space domain situation awareness? One of the ramifications of disruptive technology and situations on our current organisational structures. How do they need to change? I don't have an answer for these questions, only that we need to look at our organisations as much as we look at the technology. It's not only our operational organisations, but includes our acquisition organisations. This is highlighted in a recent paper by McLean and Dalmain on the call to action for space-based air surveillance. We often focus on the technology, but we also have to consider the operations of sustainment and the acquisition. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And now we'll have our Q&A. Questions, go put it on stop. Maybe I should just get a baby to do one. I'll stand up at the podium so that we can spare the, get, free up the second microphone for questions from the audience. I'll take the first one from Slido. And the question is for you, Phil. And it says, uh, you say that some obstacles are political. Uh, could you expand and also could you or would you see space traffic control as a commercial or governmental service? A double barrel question. Expand on political and space control. Okay, that's a uh, short one to ask, but quite a big one to answer. So, uh, so I think my, uh, in my opinion, um, the, uh, um, in terms of the technical challenge of, of, detecting, uh, of detecting stuff in space, of, of tracking where we expect it to be, um, and, uh, and interpreting that data, people have thrown an awful lot of money at uh, kind of space traffic management uh, technologies. I think a lot of that is here right now, right? So I don't think in 20 years' time we're going to be talking about the problem of space domain awareness. I think just like we don't really talk about the problem of, you know, what's wrong with air traffic control. I don't know, maybe we do, but... Uh, but not here. So uh, um, I think the obstacle really is right now it's really quite a fragmented um, set of capabilities. Um, and you have private companies that are selling data, you have uh, uh, countries you know, uh, def in their uh, defense domains that are acquiring data for themselves. Um, I think 
I think we need to find a way of integrating all of that together through legislation. It might not really need uh, any change to the existing sensor complement um, to see can we get from you know kind of 1920s uh, air traffic control to kind of modern air traffic control and uh, maybe we shouldn't beat ourselves up because it took quite a long time to get to modern international agreements governing uh, how planes move from one uh, one airspace to another um, but that's where I think we want to get to we want to get the space traffic control thanks Phil do we have a question for the audience while I explore Slido? Thank you, yeah. Along the same lines, um, I think the speakers outlined some great indigenous capabilities in Australia in especially non-traditional sensor suites, some really, really interesting stuff that's R&D and technology development. And we have geographic advantage as well. Um, so along the lines of the political, I guess, how does that integration happen and who owns it? We've got civil sector, we've got defence, we've got a lot of this non-traditional stuff coming out of the academic sector and we've got uh, great in uh, interest from industry. So. How do we bring that together? Who owns it? Who champions that in Australia? Where does that sort of show up in an investment plan that uh, caters to all those aspects and really pushes Australia forward as you know, perhaps not a dominant player but a really important niche player in the, in the global SSA uh, sort of enterprise? Maybe not even to the panel but just to the audience as well. <laughs> I mean, there are people in the audience who might be able to answer this. I'm going to give the microphone to Travis because that signifies where I think the answer is. Sure. Now, it's a good question and I'm not sure if I have the answer in terms of who owns the data. I don't know if necessarily someone needs to own it, but we definitely do need to, to share it. Um, on the uh, on the defence side, I can say that uh, on the research side, DST, we're definitely uh, investing a lot in these uh, non-traditional sensors and uh, trying to explore that research as well as also the research into um, what we do with the data and making the best use of the of the sensor resources that we have. Um, on the defence side, in the uh, integrated uh, investment plan that come out with the defence white paper, there's significant um, investment going to be into SSA. Uh, I think it was in the order of one to two billion. Um, so. Defence is definitely on board. Uh, we, they recognise that Australia needs to start uh, charging into SSA, and um, and it shows in in the investments uh, that we that we're performing. Anthony, did you want to add anything on uh, oh. Abby? Abby, uh, Anthony's just said. Um, so SSA, as you saw on our um, slide deck, is one of the priority areas uh, that we have and um, we, one of the reasons we have the RAF liaison officer with us because he's the lead on the operational side with the SSA activities. I think where we're at at the moment is getting a better grasp on the opportunities itself because it's largely been in the defence domain but I think where we're seeing in the civil side is the because there is the larger um, role of the commercial sector there's a need for greater data there's different technologies that are being used but we all need to work pretty closely with our defense colleagues to work out what that looks like um, for for australia and i think we'll probably work we'll work through that um, with the sector as well over the over the next little while Thank you. Um, hi, Sam Higgins here from Defence Department and I have got some figures in terms of what the um, Integrated Investment Program uh, says we'll spend, that was issued back in 2016 at the release of the Defence White Paper. Uh, it does talk about satellite imagery capability, uh, 3 to $4 billion dollars. Uh, through 23 th to 39, space situational awareness uh, systems and radars from 2018 to 2033, that's one to two billion. PNT from 2019 to 33 is just under a billion dollars. 
uh, the Australian Defence Satellite Communications, uh, which is current spending now through to 2029, is $2 to $3 billion. Uh, the Collins Class Satellite Communications uh, from this year through to 2024 is just under a billion dollars. And um, Maritime Communications Modernisation, which started in 2017 through 2028, is uh, up to $750 million. They're the big projects. We also do have the Defence Innovation Hub, and um, I can give you some detail separately on that if you like, but we do have a lot of detail on the website for putting in for smaller projects, which can be funded quicker than going through the investment type procurement process. Um, and I, yeah, I can provide you anyone with further information on that as required. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. So just sticking with SSA capabilities, um, there's a question here on Slido about becoming, with, it, with them becoming more effective. Effect, uh, is there an opportunity for space stealth technologies to avoid being tracked? I take it. Anyone want to tackle that? Um, I think, uh, okay, I started out as a geologist, actually, so I don't know why I'm holding the microphone right now. Uh, but uh, I personally can't think of a way that you could um, stealthily uh, have non-reflecting solar panels, and that would be quite hard. Um, so, I, so long as people need solar panels and so long as they can't paint them black, then uh, I think, yeah. We can, we can do it. So there's a technical question here and um, just maybe a little bit more detail on how accurate people can um, track orbital debris at the moment. So maybe someone could just re remember from their talk whether there's any kind of data on how close we can, I think there was a microsecond uh, comment in someone's presentation. But Uh, so the, uh, the highest fidelity I think you can get is laser ranging. Uh, and with that, um, you know, that's, that's the sort of, that's the best we can do and that's beautiful. Um, so I think, you know, if, if you wanted to kind of approach it from the point of view of a sliding scale in terms of uh, uh, defining exactly what the, you know, conjunction threat is uh, between two satellites, uh, that would be kind of end of that, of that chain of, uh, of observations. Um, the, the sort of stuff that we can do is within a few hundred meters, um, but you know, you can, but that's like I say, I kind of think about that as a baseline uh, data set, and then you, the more you pile onto that, the, uh, the more you can bring down that error lift. Yeah, I think I can um, extend on that as well. And I completely agree with Phil's comments. Um, but basically the answer depends. Um, so it depends on the, the sensor data you're getting, um, how much sensor, how long ago was that. So Phil mentioned some of the sort of um, accuracy of the sensors, but that's at that point in time. Then you need to be able to propagate forward. Um, you need to have the high fidelity models um, to, uh, to be able to have that accurate propagation. And uh, when you start looking at that and assessing um, how close things are gonna come and whether there's a conjunction, um, the accuracy depends. The, the uncertainty will um, increase depending on what orbital regime you're in, um, whether you're getting affected by drag, what shape the object is. Um, so yeah, there's no single answer to that question. We need accurate observations, but we also need the, the high fidelity models to, uh, to maintain the, um, the accuracy. Can I add to that? <laughs> Everyone wants to go. Okay, so I, I take a slightly different approach to this, which is to say, well, Fidelity is important in the traditional way of doing things, and it works really well for static systems. It becomes more difficult when you have dynamic systems, where things are moving and they're moving of their own accord. So I think the way biology and the way I look at this is that often it's better to sense fast and be wrong and correct than to be slow and accurate. And that's what we do. We don't fall over because we're continuously correcting, but we don't have perfect balance. You know, the time it takes for a signal to go from your brain to the tip of your toe is about 100 milliseconds. If we relied on transmission from the top to the bottom every time we thought we were falling over, we'd spend our time on the ground. So the point is that I think there's two approaches to this. And if you can sense fast and quickly and 90% of the time right, and you can correct because of that, you can achieve the same thing. 
And that's kind of the idea that we try to get with this idea of neuromorphic engineering, is to model that and try to build that approach as well. It's complementary, that's the secret. Did you? Can I just come back to the, the uh, stealth satellites? If, if you do a search uh, public domain, you'll find uh, a good collective paper on stealth satellites, and there's a whole series of public domain information there that's been collected over different years. Uh, some of it's weird and wonderful on different ideas, uh, but some of it is, is there, and there also, if you look up MISTI as an example as a satellite, uh, you'll see examples, so I think. <coughs> it's one of the things with SSA is, is we're gonna see more and more stealth. Uh, we've seen it in, in airplanes, uh, as is to be expected, I think, in satellites. All right, one last question, and uh, Greg, it's for you. Your event-based camera is awesome. Do you have a plan to commercialise this idea as a service? Yes, is the answer to it. Well, yes and no. Yes, we are going to commercialise, but I am the last person in the world to ever commercialise something. I'm very good at running companies into the ground, and I am smart enough to know that. So my university is taking on the commercialisation side of things. The truth is that it's an early technology, it's exciting, it's got lots of immediate applications, but there's a lot of work we have to do to demonstrate its capability, to understand its capability. We're in this weird situation where we've got capabilities, but we haven't really figured out why we can do all the things we can do sometimes. So there's a bit of science we have to go and back full. So I'm not gonna rush into it, but yes, we are gonna definitely commercialize this. I think we'd be silly not to. And then there's a follow-up. Can you flip it and put them in spaces and use them for your neuromorphic sensors for Earth observation? Yes, and we are doing that. So we have, we're on the M2 satellite with an event-based payload looking up, and we have other space missions where we're looking down. The one thing I will say, though, is that this is, again, from the biological side of view, the camera you'd use to do those two tasks, although they would have the similar uh, building blocks, it would be a fundamentally different camera and processing system. It's specialized, just like biology. The eye of a squid and the eye of an eagle do the same thing, but they're put together differently. So the camera and processing we'd want to look down has to handle a different set of circumstances than the one we have to look up. And we're trying to push as much of the algorithms and the processing into the sensor as we can. And that's how you get the speed, the power, consumption, the reliability that we need to do these sort of systems. With that, I think I might draw this panel session to a close. If you'd all like to join me in thanking our speakers for enlightenment. <laughs>
and look at the challenges that are posed and work out how those challenges impact your, your idea and what do you do about it. And we'd like to, you to do it in, in this way, is to first look at the, uh, examine the problem and, and spend a little bit of time just, just kind of working out, okay, so how does it impact our particular solution, our particular uh, idea that we're proposing, yep? And it will impact each of your teams in different ways, I have no doubt. So, that's the inner circle. Then, have a cast then around, and, okay, so what do we need to do? What do we need to strengthen our idea to overcome some of these challenges? That's the second circle. And then the, the third is that that will also have impacts. That will also have a so what attached. So do another part to kind of then go, okay, so what does that mean? What we're trying to do is to just get you to take your idea and just strengthen it a bit further and make it more robust because in the end, things will always happen. That's the purpose, yeah? So, um, We've got about an hour to do that activity, but I want to charge you first and refuel you. So we will go to morning tea, take about 20 minutes to, uh, to have morning tea and, and uh, uh, get that, coffee, uh, that caffeine fix. And then we'll herd you to your syndicates, your challenge cards will be there, all your other working material is there as well, so you can draw on all your other working material, new canvas, new challenge, onwards, preparing your idea. Any questions? Okay, caffeine awaits.